right here. Not only do we have Migos, shout out to Migos one time. <laughs> Mike, he's wearing a shirt that looks like my grandmother's tablecloth. My God. But give it up for Pastor Jonathan in the dunk tank. Why, why do you have a fake mustache on, man? I, I, that has nothing to do with freedom. Nothing. You may be seated. <laughs> freedom. It's just a, we have a master. We have a mustache on freedom. No, that's not. That's not why. <laughs> oh man, can we get? Man, we got some really creative folks at our church. Can we first give it up for uh, Chris Ledger one time? That was an amazing word on freedom, bro. I love you. And let's give it up to the worship team, especially Julie down here. My goodness gracious. <laughs> so I'm going to be honest with you. I really don't know what this secret word is. So, like, don't don't give it away. Like, don't, like, tense up your face when I say something. Like, I'm going to try to figure it out. We're going to see what, what happens tonight. But, um, Pastor Jonathan, you're going down, I promise you. Um, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn. We're going Old Testament tonight. A little bit of old, a little bit of new. Let's do uh, Numbers. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Numbers. I know God cares about numbers. He made a whole book about it. And then you should also put your finger on John chapter 8, verses 31, 32, and 36. But we'll start in numbers. When you got it, say, got it. Who has like a good old-fashioned Bible? Let me see. Wave it at me. Not many of you. Okay. iPhones, Samsungs. Pray to God your battery lasts when the demon comes. Okay. Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 through 4 read like this. That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. That soon, huh? <laughs> oh, it's going to be a fun night. <laughs> I didn't think this whole thing through. Why? <laughs> Verse 3. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taking this plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Oh, man, I figured it out already. <laughs> I love this, man. This is amazing. And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Yes. Yes. This is awesome. Oh, man. Oh, this is awesome. John 8, <laughs> verse 31, 32, and verse 36. There's no Egypts in this one. Oh, man. Yes. <laughs> to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, get serious, we're in church. If you hold to my teaching... You are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's a good place to say amen. amen. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen? amen. Oh, man. Tonight, on this Independence Day 2017, July 4th, if you want to give this message a title, I believe that you should take notes because the Bible tells us that 99% of believers that take notes will make it to heaven. Not actually true, but it'll help you while you're down here on earth for sure. If you want to give it a title, call it LA Youthrophobia. What is that? LA Youthrophobia. I can't spell it, but I can say it. <laughs> Let's pray. I'll explain what that is in a sec. Father God, I just thank you for each and every person that decided in his heart to be in this house today on Independence Day. God, we celebrate our independence 
from this world, God, knowing that we are fully dependent upon you. God, I pray for each and every person that decided to make it in this house, Lord, before they ever got here, before they ever, ever began to spin on this axis. You knew that they would be here in this house tonight. And God, I pray that you open hearts, minds, and ears to be receptive to the word of God. God, I pray that by the time it's all said and done, someone will gain true freedom. Somebody will understand what true freedom really looks like. We know it looks like your son, Jesus. God, we thank you. We praise you. Be with us for the rest of this night. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Give Jesus one more shout of praise. So I was taking a walk in Egypt the other day. I'm just, <laughs> I, oh man, it's too, it's just, oh man, it's so, it's so good, man. Never been to Egypt in my life. I'm oh, sorry, it's too fast, too fast, too fast. <laughs> July 4th, July 4th is awesome. I love, <laughs> I love Independence Day. We celebrate this day because on July 4th our founding fathers came together and old Thomas Jefferson drafted a document called the Declaration of Independence and on July 4th 1776 the first 13 colonies of America were standing as a united front to break away from the rule and reign of England yeah you can clap for that it's cool we're free <laughs> They signed a document, said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. We blast fireworks today, and honestly, there's really no significant meaning except for the fact that John Adams wanted it that way, <laughs> just like fireworks. We go to the beach. We have barbecues. It's a very awesome time that we get to unite as a nation and celebrate our independence. We get to celebrate freedom. Let freedom ring. I love freedom, but if I could be honest with you, have you ever met someone or known someone that had a hard time dealing with the freedom they had? Like sometimes freedom could just be kind of overwhelming for some. I was, uh, I was at my brother's house this past uh, Sunday after church, man, we all gathered as we usually do as a family to have our family dinners. And my brother, you just got this really cool house as a pool. It's really awesome. And when I went over there, I decided to take my dog with me. My dog's name is Coco Chanel Wilson. <laughs> my wife is clapping because it is her dog. This dog is not a manly dog. It is a Shih Tzu. It is a girl. She gives me problems. Love Coco Chanel, but Coco Chanel is used to being inside. She is a house dog. She really goes outside. Obviously, I walk her, but after that, she's just used to being in the house. Coco, if there's two words that I could use to describe her, they would be bad and bougie. <laughs> she is definitely bad. She causes problems, and she is definitely bougie. She's not bougie. She's bourgeois. <laughs> Coco won't sit where the dogs sit. She has to sit high and perched up. Coco won't eat the food that other dogs eat. She has to eat Coco's food. Coco is bad and bougie. So anyways, I took Coco with me, and I said, man, this will be good for her because she's going to get to go outside. We were hanging out at the pool. It was awesome. My brother has a dog. But not only does my brother have a dog, my mom was there. We just got my mom a dog for her last birthday. So my mom's dog is the cutest little dog in the world. Can, can we put up a picture of the dog? Bam. That's the little dog. Dog's really cool. But here's how I know my mom is saved, because the dog's name is Spirit. <laughs> Took the little white dog called him Spirit. I always have the Holy Spirit in my house. Like, that's the concept. <laughs> so Spirit, Spirit is awesome, man. Spirit is just a bundle of energy. He's only like six weeks old. He's fired up. So you got, you got Coco, you got Sabo, who is my brother's dog, and then you got Spirit. So I take, I take Coco outside. I'm like, she's going to have a fun time playing with the other dogs. She's going to jump in the pool. It's going to be awesome. Do you know what happened when I got to my brother's house? We got outside, and I was ready. And I saw little Spirit running around, zipping back and forth like crazy. Zip, zip, zip. He was just going fast. Little Sabo was running right after him. You know what Coco was doing? Being bad and bougie. Coco did not want to play. 
Coco did not want to be outside. Spirit, however, he found himself at the edge of the pool. He jumped in. He swam laps around the pool. Sable was running around the pool. Not Coco. You know what Coco was doing? Coco was scratching on the door of the house because Coco wanted to go back in the house. Coco did not want to be outside. Coco did not want to do what the other dogs were doing. So finally, I let Coco back inside the house. When I let Coco back inside the house, she perched herself up on the couch and stared out the window as if she was better than the rest of us. <laughs> She's bad and bougie. Bourgeois. And I, I, I thought to myself for a second, I said, it's funny. Like, I tried to give Coco freedom, but she didn't want to experience the freedom that I was giving her. She had a problem being free because she was so used to being in the house. She got used to something. It was part of her daily routine. So when she experienced a new thing, she did not know how to handle it, which brings me to the word that I started with, eleutherophobia, the fear of freedom. The fear of freedom. Freedom can be a very overwhelming prospect for lots of people. They don't know how to handle freedom. And Coco did not understand how to handle the freedom that I had given her because she was used to doing something the same way for a really long time. While the others around her were experiencing the fun and the freedom of life, she would rather just sit inside and watch them as they experienced the freedom that they lived in. Looks like a lot of different people. If you can really think about LA eutherophobia, most people think that the origin of this word happened because of the same people that I read about earlier. When the Israelites had left a certain place, <laughs> and I won't say just yet, they got out into the wilderness. And when they did, do you know what they did? They, they complained the entire time. They complain because you have to understand, a lot of them were born into slavery. And because they were born into slavery, you have to understand that they didn't understand what it really felt like to be free. So when they got the freedom, when they finally experienced the freedom, they didn't know how to operate in it. So this Greek word, eleuthero, which means freedom and phobia which means fear which gives us the fear of freedom was designed around the context of the story that I just read to you so people had a fear of freedom so much so they complained constantly I mean if I if I could read all the scriptures to you from about Exodus 5 to about Numbers 21 do you know that the Israelites complain about 14 different times just complain about everything Oh, we, we ain't got no water. Moses is hitting rocks so water can come out. Oh, we ain't got no food. God's dropping food from him. Oh, we want a God we could see. So they make a golden calf. Like they're constantly complaining. And every time they complain, they say, man, it would just be so much better if we could go back to Egypt. Man, you ain't a... Set it up for you, man, on a silver platter, man. It would be so much better if we could go back to the land that enslaved us. I would rather sit around the pots of meat in that enslaved land than to be free. The food in there was better than what we got out here. This is a perspective that so many different people have. Whether they say it or not, most people don't know how to operate in the freedom that Christ truly gives us. They have a fear of freedom. I mean, it's so bad at some points, even Moses' own sister begins to complain against him. She's like, Moses, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know. You ain't no real leader. And God looks at her and says, leprosy. And that same finger goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> Serious, read the Bible. That's what happened. People have a fear of freedom. And I, I, I began to really think about this, like, how they get this fear of freedom and why, why do people operate in this fear? We know that we are children of God. We sang the song and we know that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love and a sound mind. Why are so many people scared of freedom? On a day that we celebrate independence, 
I can trace its origins back to the Israelites, and maybe we can find some of the answers. Why did they fear freedom so much? I think one of the reasons, and there's a million reasons, but one specific one I'll give you is I think people feared freedom because they'd rather have routine. They'd rather have routine. Look what Numbers 14, 1 through 2 says. It says, that night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. I have to laugh while I'm reading it. And the whole assembly said to them, if we had only died in Egypt. <laughs> That's the perfect word, man. See, what you have to understand is the land that enslaved them was routine for them. It was the pattern that they were used to. They would rather go back to the place that enslaved them because that is the place that they were used to. It was a place that developed a routine. You know something else can become very common and very routine, and it's another R word. It's called religion. Religion can become very routine, and here's the truth about religion. Religion is not freedom. People get the two confused so many times. Religion is not freedom. Here's what religion does. Religion tells you where to go, how to get there, who to sit next to, why to sit next to them, what to eat, how to eat it, when to eat it, what to do, how to do it, when to do it. That's what religion tells you what to do. Religion is not freedom. See, I have an issue with the routine of religion because what happens is when you get stuck in this routine of religion, you know what you start to do? When you really get stuck in a routine, you'll begin to believe that you have something to do with the way that you are. If I could just do this so many times, then I'm going to be this. No, you won't. You cannot dictate who God has designed you to be. You can walk in it. You can accept it. You can live in it. But you can't dictate it through a set of rituals and regulations. But so many people... They operate this way. Why? Because they think that religion is safe. Or other way I might say it is they might think slavery is safe. That's what the Israelites did. You say, what are you talking about? People do this all the time. Oh, yeah, let me, let me, just, let me, just, um, let me just commit this crime so I can go back to prison because at least there I know I got three hots in a cot. Like, you say, that's, that's crazy. No, some people actually want to go back to prison because they're used to that way of life. It talks about the messed up prison system that we have that does not reform them, but it transforms them into animals that will allow them to continue to live in that kind of situation. Maybe, um, you know what? I know that I should be free, but I want to stay trapped in this prison because here's the truth. The prison that I just spoke about is not the only prison people get trapped in. Most times people get trapped in the prison of their own mind. You say, well, what does that look like? Ah, uh, I want to leave him, but I won't. Because I, 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 love, I loved him. I mean, he, he, he cheats on me, and I know. He beats me, but I, I, I know. But, but I'm probably better off with him because I think that there might be one that comes along that's even worse with him, so I might as well stay. You're in a relationship prison. Uh, here's what it sounds like. It says, maybe, maybe I won't pay attention to my bills. Because if I don't pay attention to them, then they're not there. And if they're not there, then maybe they'll go away. And if they go away, then maybe they won't exist. No, they're going to come hunt you down. Some of y'all are trapped in that bad credit prison. Because you don't want to acknowledge what's already there. Nobody likes me. Maybe I'm just better off alone. I, I, I don't need anyone. I just want to do this by myself. I don't say that in joking because there's too many people trapped in that prison of depression. You might be in here tonight. I want you to know that God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He loves you. You're never alone. He created you. So he always stands with you, even if you don't realize that he's always with you. People put themselves 
in prison. Why does this happen? Because not only are we a beautiful spirit that God has developed inside of us, we are flesh. Your flesh wants to kill you. You have this thing called a brain. You know what your brain wants to do all day long? Pastor Rob, I'm going to attest to this. It wants to develop patterns. It's called brain pathways. See, I'll be listening when you be talking sometimes. (laughs) All the time. Especially when you talk about Egypt. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) You got way too comfortable. See that routine, man. You got to break out of that routine. Is that mustache still for freedom? I'm trying to figure out. Okay. People create these things called brain pathways. And what happens is with these brain pathways, you develop routines. You develop ways of being. But don't allow your brain, which is physical, to allow your spirit to be imprisoned. See, here's what I want you to understand. We serve the type of God that wants to create something new within you. How do you know? The Bible tells me so. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19 says, forget the former things. Forgetting means that you are taking something out of your mind. You are not allowing it to fill up space in your brain anymore. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Think about a new thought. Some of you have been living in the same situation because you continue to live in the prison of your past. Dang, we we closing up that early? Okay. Got got a little more to go, but yeah, you can rock with me if you want to. Man. (laughs) I love what the verse says next. It says, I am doing, so God says, a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness. What is God saying? Where there is no way, I will create one. I'm creating a new pathway, one that your brain cannot fathom, but one that the spirit will lead you through. But then it also goes and says, I'm going to make streams in the wasteland. What is a stream? It's water. A wasteland is deserted. So God will bring life to places where there is no life. God wants you to create a new pathway that is led by his spirit. For the steps of the righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Here's what I found, though. So many times in this story just shows me that it's true. People that have no vision for their future will always be looking to go back to their past. Had no vision. The Israelites had no vision for what God wanted to take him. So all they did was accept what they had already been through. Why does this happen? Because they've never really experienced freedom before. They think they know what freedom is, but how can you know what something is that you've never experienced? You were born into slavery. So you get out of Egypt and you think the game is over, but that was only half of the battle. So they get out into this wilderness, and here's the truth. People fear freedom because they think they know what freedom is. They think they know. Look look what Numbers 14.2 says. I'm going to read it again. It says, if only we had died in that place or the wilderness. So if Egypt represents, (laughs) if that word represents routine, then wilderness represents something different. Here's the thing. Getting out of Egypt or the routine, like I said, was only half the battle. They still had to make their way through the wilderness. Here's what I want you to understand. Wandering is not freedom either. Yeah. Come on. Yes, Religion and routine is not freedom, but neither is wandering. That's all they did. I mean, could you imagine for 40 years going in circles? You left one place and the place you should have got to, which you got promised you actually should have got to in a week. But you took 40 years of wandering. You know, I know a lot of people that wander and they think they call it freedom. Oh, I'm free. It's my body. I do what I want with it. I don't say no to drugs. I say yes. I do what I want to do when I want to do it. My body, my life is my own. I don't have to answer to anybody but me. Those people aren't free. Those people are wandering. They're wandering. 
they're wandering and they think that it's really called freedom. Why? Because they've never experienced what freedom truly is. They're wandering. Too many people confuse wandering with freedom. And the truth is, the farther they go, the freer that they think they are. But the farther they go, the farther they are wandering from God. And the truth is that they've just traded in one master for another. It's not freedom, it's wandering. Walking around, people think that they're free, but they have no idea. And because... They confused the wandering of the wilderness with freedom. Look what the Israelites say next. Numbers 14, 3, it says, why, this just kills me. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken to plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back? Look at the first thing they said. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land only to let us fall by the sword? The interesting thing about this is that they are acknowledging that God got them out of their first prison in the first place. They're mad. They're mad. They're mad. They have acknowledged out of their own mouth that God is the one that got them out of Egypt. They had faith for that, but they don't have faith about him getting them into the promised land. So you have to understand the context to this story. Moses sent out 12 different spies. Only two came back with a good report, Joshua and Caleb. They said that, man, this is the land flowing with milk and honey. There's grapes the size of our heads there. It's amazing. And Caleb said, yeah, we can take it. We can do it. But the other team came back with a bad report, and they said, man, the people, they are massive, and they're going to look at us, and they're going to think that we're the size of grasshoppers. The people never said that to them. This is what the people assumed that the people thought about them. How crazy is that? Why? Because they had a slavery mentality. They thought they understood what freedom was. And here's the thing that you have to understand. It's going to be a lot of people that can acknowledge what God has done, but they cannot acknowledge what God is doing. God got us out, the, God got us out of that crazy place. But why did he bring me here to die? You just said he brought you here. If he brought you this far, don't you think he could take you the rest of the way? Because yeah. God never wanted to get him to the promised land. He wanted him to live in the promised land. So many people get to the promised land. And it doesn't turn out the way they, they see something or they hear something that pushes them away from the promised land. God's goal was never for you to get there. It was for you to live there. They got there and they got discouraged because something happened. Because they had an experience. Because they saw something. Something happened. This looks a lot like people in 2017 when it comes to church. We get here. So many people come. So many people see something. So many people have an experience. And they leave before God can do what he has promised to do. It's crazy. Like, it's like, it's like this. Like, one, one summer I'll never forget. I jump in the car with my family. Um, my baby girl, Vava. Hey, Vava, I should be in kid zone. Okay, yeah, Vava, my wife. It's awesome. And we drove up to Orlando to Disney World. Oh, we got there. She was fired up. Like, you know how kids get so fired up, like, they can't talk. They be like, Neem! like, they start tweaking. Like, so, 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 so we get there. She's tweaking. She's going crazy. And, and we drive through that sign that says, welcome to Disney World. And then you see the giant Mickey, like, ha, ha. Like, you see all that, right? It's awesome, right? He's waving at you. And you get there, and you pull in. It's awesome. Everybody's smiling. And then you get to the parking lot. We got to the Aladdin parking lot because we were in the heroes parking lot, not the villains. And it was really awesome. And we pulled up, and I parked, and I unlocked the doors. And then you know what I did right after? I locked the doors. I turned the car back on. I drove out, and we went back home. Exactly. Who does that? No one does that. If I did that, my daughter would hate Disney World for the rest of her life because of the bad experience that comes. Here's what happens. So many people come to church and they come, but they don't experience it for real. They get a bad little thing that happens. 
to them and instead of really developing strong relationships by being involved in the happiest place on earth they turn around and go home before God can ever do something in their life stop a lot of us look like we go into Disney World and we turn around before we walk in the gate cause ooh he said something about me I ain't I ain't like the way they looked at me. Hello. I can't. I, they play Beyonce Freedom for the FaceTime. I'm not going to that heathen church. They had someone in the dunk tank. Mm, heathens. Instead of you taking the time to figure out what we're really about, you judge based upon an experience. I'd call that a fear of freedom. Man, I love my homeboy, Sean. Me and him serve every week out in the parking lot together. We've been doing it for like nine months. But before Sean ever served out in the parking lot, here's what I loved about him. He was like, T, I just want to know God more. I'm like, man, keep coming. <laughs> keep coming. Just keep coming. He's like, all right. So he kept coming. He's like, man, T, I want to know God more. I said, okay. You coming, right? Yeah. Start serving. <laughs> T, I want to know God more. Man, start serving. I want to know God, man, start serving. So he started serving. We started serving out in the parking lot. It was awesome. Been doing it for eight or nine months. Do you know what happened last month? Here's what Sean did. Sean got tired of hearing me say the same thing. You know what he started doing? Not only did he start serving, he started engaging, and he started getting other people engaged. Do you know that for the past month, his older brother, Junior, and his younger brother, Brian, have been serving out in the parking lot with him? Because they came from a place of I'm just going to keep coming to actually getting involved and building powerful, strong relationships that is getting him closer to God than any sermon that I could ever preach could get him. You got to understand, you can't just, like, I'm going to always say keep coming. But when is your relationship with God going to go past you just coming? Just showing up. It ain't enough. The Bible says faith without works is dead. We can't just be the church that comes when there's fireworks. We can't just be the church that shows up when the food is free. Because here's the truth. The food is free every weekend. Somebody died 2,000 years ago to put a meal on your plate that will fill you up more than anything that you could ever eat in your life. You know what gets me, though? Here's my two-second angry preacher rant. When people say, I ain't being fed, I say, you ain't eating. You ain't eating. Because here's, here's what I've come to realize. You know who you feed? You feed babies. I'm okay with feeding babies. Because babies don't know how to feed themselves. So I'm, I'm a spoon feed a baby. But if your grown tail been up in church for 100 years and you talk about you ain't being fed, you know what I'm going to do? When you come to my house, after the 100th time of coming to my house, I ain't feeding you nothing. I'm going to say go to the fridge and get your own stinking food because you are an adult. Feed yourself. Feed yourself. If you ain't eating, if you ain't being fed, because you ain't eating. The word of God is being delivered each and every time somebody comes on this. I could go in the kid zone and hear a word and chew on it for weeks. Don't tell me you ain't being fed. That was longer than 30 seconds. I'm sorry. Man, you, you know why? You know why they don't want to get him engaged with the promised land, though. They got a, God got us to the promised land. You know why they didn't want to engage? Cause it looked too hard. It looked hard. And yo, I get it. Maybe this is your first time here, man. I get it. Maybe you've been sitting here for a while. You're like, yo, man, y'all too like happy. Y'all too, like, friendly? Like, I don't know if I could get in there with that. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert. Pastor Robin preached one of the greatest things of all time in a staff chapel we had the other day. She said, hey, 
You know what I used to tell my kids? Push your happy button and engage people. You might be upset. You might not be having a good day, but when you come into the house of God, there's days where I will not lie to you. I don't want to get out of my bed and I say, God, again, I preach the same sermon and they still ain't listening. You know what I do? I push my happy button. I smile and say, man, I'm so glad you came today. Because even if I can't change my situation, I could change me. I'm an artist. I'm a natural introvert. But I choose to connect with people because a sermon and a song will not build a relationship. I actually got to do work for that. I got, I got, like, the Israelites didn't want to do it because it was work. Man, you see how big they are? We can't, we can't fight them. God already promised them before they went into the, he said, hey, go send spies into the land which I am giving you. He didn't just say go send spies to the land and figure it out. No. The land was promised to them before they went to go see the land. But because they saw something in the land they didn't like, they didn't want to do the work to get the land. War was still required for them to take the land. Work was still required for them to take the land. A lot of people don't want to put in the work because it ain't easy. And if I could be really honest with you, I get it. I get it. It's work. Freedom ain't easy. <laughs> but the good thing is, the hard work's already been done. The hard work's already been done. So here's the last thing. The band may come up. Oh, they're already here. <laughs> People fear freedom because they don't want to know the truth. Some people just don't want Truth is, freedom ain't easy to come by, but here's the ultimate truth. Freedom is Jesus. Freedom, Christopher said a whole poem on freedom is Jesus. For John 8, 31, 32, and verse 36 says, To the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, If you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But you can't be free if you don't want to know the truth. What's the truth? If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the Son, oh man, if you knew how good that verse was, you'd be cheering right now. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We all know the hard road that Jesus took to give us freedom. It sure wasn't easy, but he did it. He did it. The verses I just read to you transcribe a part of a conversation with the great descendants of the same people that didn't want to walk into the promised land and wanted to go back to Egypt. These people were saying, hey, um, yeah, we, we, don't, we don't really vibe with you like that, um, Jesus, because, you know, our father is Abraham and we are not illegitimate children. And Jesus says, hey, you got a bigger problem than that. You got a sin problem and I'm your only way out. We're not slaves. That's what they were saying to Jesus. They, they literally argued back and forth with Jesus. So we we slaves, man. He said, oh yeah, without me you are. Because unless I set you free, you will not be free. And you know what I thought about? <laughs> These same people wanted to kill Jesus. You know why they weren't free? Because they feared Jesus. How many people did, do you know that are not free because they fear Jesus? Jesus is not the person to be afraid of. People fear him. Why? Because they know that when they accept Jesus, there's a standard of life that they have to now live up to. You know how many times I heard people, Pastor T, man, hey, hey, T, like, yo, I want to come to church, but like, I know, like, if I do that Jesus thing, I'm going to have to get my life right. I ain't ready for that yet. Like, I, like, I, like, 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 I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to let him down. Man, I could preach that all day. I, 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 I don't want to. I don't want to let him die. I, yeah. If I, if I, if I accept Jesus, then I can't continue to live the way that. I'm, of course not. You got to develop a new pathway, a new pattern, something different. If I accept him, honestly, man, I, I, I can't blame some people when they say that, though. You know why? 
because they've had bad experiences. Or if they watch the way that some of us live for Jesus and say, I don't want no part of that. If Jesus looks like you, I don't want that. Because because I, I got a perception of who Jesus is, and I don't think he would be cool with what you're doing right now. The funny part is, is here's what happens. When we claim to live for Jesus, and there's folks on the outside that want to push away Jesus because they may fear living up to a certain standard because of who he is, when they see the way that you live, you know what you're doing? If you don't live for Jesus the right way, you're giving them bad intel on the promised land. Say, well, the Israelites did not want to walk into the promised land because they got some bad intel. Ten people told them the wrong thing. They got bad intel on the promised land. I would say that some of us are giving bad intel to our friends about the promised man. Bad intel. Eleutherophobia. You know how doctors say you overcome it? Information. <laughs> Information. How do you overcome the fear of freedom? Information. When you have good information, you have less to fear. When I walk into a situation knowing what I'm walking into, I fear less. The other day, a couple Sundays back, my wife um, hosted a dinner party at our home. And it was part of an initiative. The initiative was called Day of Dinners. Uh, you can put up the picture. So my wife doesn't know any of those people. Those aren't friends of our family. L look at the caption. It says, an elderly war veteran, uh, Caribbean immigrant, an ex-alcoholic, a lesbian, pastor, an activist, all sat around a table to break bread. So I just hosted dinner at my home with complete strangers. It was scary at first, but as each guest arrived, I felt my spirit calm and felt so connected to my humanity. My wife sat about around a, a table with a bunch of strangers that we did not know at our house and she felt connected to them. She felt a sense of humanity. You know why? Because as she sat around the table and they began to have an open conversation, they were able to share each other's humanity with one another. And the information that she got about those people that were sitting at the same table began to alleviate her fears. A lot of us, man, yeah, we're believers. Awesome. I'm going to preach Jesus till the cows come home. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. But here's what I got to say. I don't have to push people away from me because of that fact. People should be drawn to me because of that fact. Like a lot of us feel like just because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, we can't have a conversation. Because you want your view to be heard, but you don't want to hear somebody else's. Yeah, we know what truth is. But how can you get people to listen to you if you're not willing to listen to them? A conversation will not take away your salvation if you know who, who, if, who you're rooted in. Rooted in Jesus. I can have a conversation. And it's not break down my salvation. I love it because... They got to see each other's humanity. And man, if you were here on Sunday night, man, we saw it right out here. About 200 of us just sat down and broke bread. It's amazing the things that can happen around a dinner table. It's the way that Jesus did it. I would challenge each and every one of you, man, on your off time. Why don't you start to build relationships with people in the house and start to break bread? Because whether you realize it or not, the person sitting next to you is family. They may not look like you. They may not talk like you. They may not act like you. But man, imagine the fear that will leave your spirit if you just had a conversation with them. If you just talk to them. How do you be Eleutherophobia? Information. How many slaves will remain slaves if they had good information? 
If slaves knew that they outnumbered their masters, do you think they'd remain slaves? If slaves knew how to read, do you think they'd remain slaves? How many people in this country get hurt or killed because of the officers in their neighborhood that are scared to work in the neighborhoods that they work in or the people that are scared of the officers that work in their neighborhood? You know what it is? Bad information. How many people would be patrons of the sex traffic game, of the pornography game, if they knew how many lives they actually destroyed and how many people would actually work in that situation if they knew that there was another option? People just don't have the right information. How many people would come to church if they knew that their life did not have to be as hard as it is right now? People just got bad information, bad intel. How many people would you invite to church if you knew that God wanted to use you as their last option to meet him? Bad intel. Information is the key to overcoming Ellie euthrophobia. See, the Bible would call it not information. They would call it the right information. They would call it truth. <laughs> Doctors call it information. Jesus calls it truth because it is the truth that sets you free. It's the truth that sets you free. See, that document that was signed on July 4th, 1776 may have separated us from another nation, but it did not bring us closer to the kingdom of God because people have committed atrocities all throughout history in the name of that same document, even though it says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Here's what I want you to understand. We don't need another declaration. We don't need another document. There is only one thing in all of history that is evidence that we are united. That is evidence that we are free. And it is the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ, for what to wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I don't need another firework. I don't need another piece of paperwork. All I need is the blood that washes me white as snow. And because of that blood, there are no stepchildren. There are no illegitimate children. We are all sons and daughters of the Most High God. And today truly is an Independence Day. 